I'm going to be honest, I didn't know what kind of tree Rafiki lived in, so that was the one I missed on that. But hey, it is so good to see each of you here. Welcome to the kickoff of our At The Movie series. I'm so glad that you're joining us. And if I haven't had a chance to personally meet you yet, my name is Aaron, and I'm the lead pastor here at NCC. And maybe it's your first time, maybe you're watching online and worshiping with us online for the first time. So welcome, or if you're here in person, welcome. We are so glad that you are with us as we kick off this brand new series. It's going to be a great few weeks together. I think the year was somewhere around like 2006, 2007, and my wife and I were student pastors in Illinois, and we had to make a trip to Dallas. And so our older son, Matt, um, he's our adopted older son. He was in high school, and he said, Dad, can I go with you, and can we stop by the JFK Memorial? Has anyone been to the book depository um, where President Kennedy was assassinated? So he could get extra credit points if we stopped by there. So I have a picture of me somewhere around this time um, of our family together, just so you can get a little bit of what I look like, okay? So this was somewhere around the time. That's me. You can tell a lot fewer gray hairs, a lot fewer wrinkles, okay? Um, but this is somewhere, yeah, around that time. So we make our trip down to Dallas from Illinois. We do whatever we had to do, and then we stop in downtown Dallas by the book depository. And as we're making our way, like we pay the money to go through this, I notice these high school students are staring at us and following us. And at first, I'm kind of like, okay, I'm just imagining it. But everywhere we go, they're kind of taking pictures of us and following after us. And then I start to get paranoid, okay? And I'm like, is something on my face? Is something wrong with my outfit? What's going on? And so finally, when we get to the end of the tour, one of the high school students comes up and says, I know this is going to sound crazy, but are you Lenny Kravitz? I have a side-by-side here, okay? Just so you guys can get this image, okay? I don't know how you get from me to Lenny Kravitz, but somehow they did, okay? I guess the hair, the beard maybe, I don't know what it was. Um, and, And so I had to apologize, like, hey, thank you so much, I'm flattered. You don't want my autograph, I promise it's not worth anything, and you don't want a picture with me. But you guys, I was floating on cloud nine that day, let me tell you, okay? I felt pretty good about myself that I had gotten mistaken for Lenny Kravitz. That's like the best, I've been told I look like a lot of people, but that was like the best mistaken identity that I've ever gotten. And I want to talk to you this morning about identity. And we're, like I said, we're in this new series called At The Movies, and this morning we're looking at this movie called The Lion King. And I want to tell you, in this series, we're going to look at some of our favorite movies, movies that make us laugh, cry, right, that bring out emotions in us. And we're going to look at some of the truths that these stories tell. And we're going to look how these truths reflect back to the truth of Scripture. Now, I need to say this just so we all keep this in our mind. Everything we're going to see over the next couple weeks are fictitious stories, okay? I don't think any of us believe that lions can really talk in Africa, okay? Maybe, but but they're not true stories. But what we do, what we're going to see in Scripture, these are true stories. And we say this a lot here at NCC, that Scripture shapes our lives. That the truth that we find in the Bible talks about who God is. God is revealing his character to us. He's revealing what he's dreaming for us and the purpose and the meaning and the plans that he has for our lives. And so although we're going to look at some fictitious stories that are really great, we're also going to look at the truth of scripture and see how from the Bible we can learn more about ourselves and who God is and what God is dreaming over each and every one of us. This week we were talking um, with our staff and someone asked, hey, did you see the Lion King when it first came out in theaters. And I was like, yeah. And one of our staff members is like, no, I was one year old. And I was like, I was in high school, okay? Just to date myself a little bit, okay? So if you guys, but I remember seeing it in the theater and it was like such an epic movie. If you've never seen it, this story of Simba, who's the future king, his dad, Mufasa, who is the current king, and um, Mufasa's brother, Scar, who doesn't want Mufasa or Simba to be king. Scar wants to be king. He wants to take over power in this whole thing. And so we're following this story of Simba's story, really, of him understanding his identity, understanding what it means to be king and what that eventually looks like, how that plays out in his his life. And so this morning, I want to challenge you first with this thought that you and I don't run from your true identity, run towards it. 
Don't run from your true identity. Run towards it. That's something Simba had to learn. And this is the thing. Mistaken identity will lead you into dangerous places. Mistaken identity will lead you into dangerous places. Let's watch this first clip. See, so Simba, when you're watching this movie, he understands that his identity is to be king, but he's mistaken in what that truly means. Because for him, his idea of being king is, I can do whatever it is that I want to do. Like, everyone is here to serve my wants or my wishes, and they've got to follow all of my decisions. But we see Mufasa is a different type of king, that his life is about serving. His life is about sacrificing, that him being king isn't just him getting his own way. It's more than that, but he is willing to lay down his life for others. And so as this story plays out, we see this, that Simba and Nala actually end up in a dangerous place because they think, hey, I'm the future king and I can do whatever it is that I want to. And you guys, we find ourselves in similar situations, in similar circumstances so many times that we mistake what our true identity is and we think our life is just about ourselves, right? That we can do whatever it is that we want to do, that our life should revolve around us and we forget what it is that God has truly said about our lives and mistaken identity will lead us into dangerous places. We see this story at the very beginning of the scriptures in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there or you can write some of these scriptures down that we're going to walk through today. And I want to encourage you to go back this week and look a little bit more into these scriptures, read on these, reflect these. We see this in Genesis chapter 1, God created everything. He made the sun and the skies and the water and the land, all of the creatures, all of the trees and everything that we see in there. He formed man and woman. And then look at this in Genesis 1.28. He looks at the first man and woman and it says, God bless them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You may not know it or not, but your true identity is that God has called you a king or a queen in his kingdom. That's your identity. Just like Simba, we're learning to grow into that identity. But that's what God has spoken. He spoke it over the first man and woman. I have created you to rule with me. I've created you to reign with me. I have created you so that you can create. That is the identity that God has for our lives. That is what he's spoken over each of us. We see it in Genesis chapter 2 as well, is that he places them in the garden and he invites them to create and to build and to do something with the world that he has given them. But in Genesis 3, we, like Simba, believe the lie of someone else. And in the movie, The Lion King, Scar lies to Simba. And he tells them, hey, a king can do whatever he wants. Brave kings go to the elephant graveyard. And it ends up putting him in a very dangerous spot. And in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve believe the lie of Satan. That somehow Yahweh is holding out on us. That to truly rule and reign means that we do things our own way. We don't have to listen to God and we don't have to follow his instructions. We can do it all of ourselves. And this mistaken identity ends up time and time again throughout history, causing us to be in dangerous parts of our life when we believe that we don't have to listen to God or what it is that he's speaking over our life. This is something that we all face time and time again when we get ourselves in dangerous places, when we think, hey, we don't have to listen to God. We don't have to follow his instructions that we can do it our own way. This ends up in broken relationships, you guys. When we think this world is all about us, it ends up in untamed passions, in addictions that control us when we think, God, you're holding out, and so I'm going to ignore your instructions. I'm going to ignore what you've spoken over my life. I am going to do things my own way. It ends up isolating us from people we love. Mistaken identity will always lead you into dangerous places. When you've taken and you've forsaken what it is that Yahweh says, you and I will find ourselves in dangerous situations. But it's not only an issue of mistaken identity, it's forsaken identity. And forsaken identity will leave others around you in destruction. 
See, that's where Simba finds himself at is he has forsaken. He's walked away from his true identity that he was called to be king. And it's because of tragedy. If you've seen the movie, um, Scar has lied to him about his dad's death and what really caused that and everything. But he has chosen to just walk away from everything. But it didn't only affect Simba's life. Like if you've seen the movie, what's going on in Pride Rock at this point? What was this beautiful green luscious kind of safari type area with full of animals full of life like the stream that runs through it is now a deserted wasteland there is no green grass like all of it is just broken up dirt there's no stream no longer running through there there are no animals scar and the hyenas have destroyed all of the life and because simba has chosen to walk away from what he's truly called called to be it not only affected him but it affected others around him. See, that's what forsaken identity does. It will leave others around you in destruction. And I don't know what kind of tragedy you've been through. And I don't know each and every one of your stories that are sitting in this room, but we will face difficulty. And when we face hard circumstances, sometimes that's our only thought or that's our only idea is to run away from who we have truly been called to be. But when we do that, it not only impacts us, it impacts others. And once again, we see this story over and over and over again in Scripture of forsaken identity. Once again, you can write down some of these passages and go back and read them and reflect on them at a different time. But in Genesis chapter 20, we're told about this guy named Abraham. Maybe you've heard about him, okay? Abraham was someone that God looked at and said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to take care of you. I've got your back, Abraham. If anything happens in your life, I'm looking out for you. You don't have to worry about it, Abraham. I've got you covered. I'm going to protect you. And so Abraham finds himself traveling to this different country with his wife, Sarah. And he looks over at Sarah and he says, Sarah, you are so beautiful that I want you to do me a favor. When we get to Egypt... Don't tell them you're my wife. Say that you're my sister. Because you're so beautiful, I'm afraid that if you tell them you're my wife, they're going to kill me, they're going to do something to me, and then they're going to take you. And so that's the plan. That's what they do. Abraham forsakes his responsibility and his identity as a husband. And because of that, when they get to Egypt, Sarah goes along with that, okay? Ladies, this is just another truth from the Bible that we as guys make some really dumb decisions, okay? We need some help here. But that's what happens, right? And Sarah goes along with this. And eventually they bring Sarah in the palace. And thankfully, before anything happens, it's revealed, hey, she is Abraham's wife. But think about that moment, what kind of position that put Sarah in when Abraham steps away from his identity as a husband. He doesn't trust God. He doesn't trust that God's got his back or that God's going to provide. And it puts Sarah in a very dangerous position. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, there's this guy named David. Maybe you've heard of David and Goliath. That's the same guy. And David is king at this point. And the Bible tells us that this is the time of the year when kings would go out to battle. Kings were supposed to be leading. That was the identity of kings is to lead their troops into battle. And yet in this moment, David forsakes his identity as a king. And he just hangs back in the palace. And at this point, he's not really king. He's not doing what a king's supposed to do. And he is just another rich guy in a mansion. And being in that position puts him in a situation where he sees a young woman bathing. And he invites her into the palace. He sleeps with her. And all of a sudden, there is destruction all around David. You look at God's hand over David's life up until that point. But at that moment where David walks away from his identity of king to be righteous, to be just, and he takes advantage of this young woman. And now all of a sudden, David's household is torn apart. This woman's husband is killed basically by David's command, by the words of David. David's own kids end up dying, some of his kids. His own kids rebel against them. One of David's own sons rapes his sister. There is destruction all around David. When you and I choose to walk away from our true identity, when we forsake what it is that God has called us to be and what God has spoken over our life, I can promise you there will be destruction not only in your life, but for others around you. One more story. You look at Jonah in Jonah chapter 1. 
You can write that down and read the story of Jonah later. But he is this prophet who's called to speak the word of the Lord. And he ends up running in the opposite direction. He gets on this boat and there is this crazy storm. And because Jonah has walked away from that calling to be a prophet, everyone else on that ship is in danger. We see it time and time again that when you and I choose to do things our own way, when we forsake the calling of God over our life and the identity that God has spoken over us, it not only affects our lives, it impacts others. And so parents in the room, when you're not stepping up into the responsibility that God has called you to, if you are too busy at work, too busy with yourself to really impact your kids and you begin to neglect them, you don't spend time with them, you don't speak to them and help them grow spiritually, you are not that reflection that God has called you to be. It is no surprise when your kids turn away from the Lord and start to do their own thing. Because your forsaken identity not only impacts you, it will impact others. Spouses, Whenever you and I choose to not love and respect the person God's put in our lives, when we forsake that for images on a screen, for flirtation or some kind of romantic fling with someone at work or someone we found online, it will bring destruction not only to your life but to those around you. Forsaken identity will destroy those that are around you. They are going to reap what it is that you are sowing. And so you guys, we have to understand what it is that God has called us to be, what it is that God has spoken over our lives and that we would choose to live those things out. But let me tell you this, restored identity brings new life. Restored identity brings new life. I love that movie because you get that emotion at the end of what happens when Simba does step up into the calling of who he's called to be, into his identity as king, and it does, it brings new life. And you guys, it's like that in our life, that we can have the wrong idea of who God has called us to be. We can even step away from that, but it doesn't matter how much time has passed or what's gone on in our past, that when you and I choose to step into what God has spoken over our lives, it brings life not only to us, but to those around us that's what restored identity does in the in the scripture we see this that God challenges us in his word of what we've been called to be and the impact that makes over others Colossians 3 10 says this that we have put on the new self we've stepped into that new identity and it's being renewed in the knowledge after the image of our creator that we are a reflection of God everywhere that we go everywhere that we are students in your classroom adults in your workplace we are meant to be a reflection of our God to the world around us Ephesians 2 10 says this you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that you should walk into in them That's your identity, that before you were ever even born, before you ever took your first step, God saw every moment of your life, and he's been planning for you. He has a purpose. There's things that he's spoken over you that you would put on display the goodness of God to the world around you. 2 Peter 2, 9 says this, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellency of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, there are a lot of voices in our life, some good, some like Simba's Uncle Scar, that are going to lie to us and beat us down. There are going to be things that happen in our life, tragedy. But my challenge this morning to you, church, my challenge to everyone listening is to listen and to open up your heart to what it is that God is saying about your life to the identity that God has spoken over you what it is that he has said about you that you would step into that because as you do that it brings life don't run from your true identity but run towards it open up the scripture listen to what it is that God has said how God wants to use your life what the calling of God is over your life the purpose and the meaning that God brings when we don't just live for ourselves when we don't walk away from our true calling, that God uses us to bring life to so many others. So this is what I want to challenge 
you to do this morning from this simple message is that you would understand your true identity. That this week, maybe you've not done this in the past, but this week you would speak that out and you would realize what it is that God has called you to be, what it is that God has spoken over your life. So I'm going to show you how to do this. My challenge for you this week is to find a a verse in the Bible of what God has said over you and to say that every single day, every single day. Now, maybe you're watching this online and you're like, I don't know any Bible verses, okay? So there's this amazing thing called Google, okay? Really simple. All you have to do is open it up, and you can simply type in Bible verses, what God says about my identity, and you're going to get hundreds of them, okay? Because God says a lot of stuff about us in Scripture. But I'm going to show you how you can simply do this, and you can steal what I'm about to give you, okay? 2 Peter 2.9, this verse right here. Okay, I think we can put it back up on the screen. 2 Peter 2, 9 says this right here. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's possession, that you may proclaim the excellency of him who called you in out of darkness into his marvelous light. So you're going to personalize that. That's what God has said over your life. So this week, you wake up, you take this verse, and you say this, God, you've chosen me. Okay? In this room, we faced a lot of rejection, haven't we? Different people in our lives, people that we thought should have been for us, that have rejected us, people that should have shown up in your life and they walked out on your life. But let me tell you this, Yahweh has chosen you. That's your identity, church. That's what he said is, I saw you and I wanted you, so I chose you. That's your identity. And then you go on, you've called me a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for your possession. And that means, God, in my life that I'm putting on display your goodness, that I have a chance to show the world around me your marvelous light. And so that's your declaration this week. God, you've chosen me. You've placed your righteousness in me, God, so that I could put you on display for the world around me. That is your identity. So you can steal what I just gave you and every day this week, wake up in the morning and say that, God, you've chosen me. Doesn't matter what happens. Doesn't matter what other people have said about me. God, you have chosen me. And you've put your righteousness in me, Lord, so I could show your goodness to the world around me. That's the identity that I'm choosing to walk in, Lord. That's the identity, God, that's going to bring new life to everyone else around me is when I understand what you've said about me. Now, you can choose a different verse and do that same thing, personalize it, and say, God, this is what you're saying over me. But I want to challenge you that every morning this week you wake up, you remember your true identity. You remember what God has spoken over you. You remember how God has created you. You put the tragedy and the rejection and all of that brokenness behind you. And you choose, God, I'm going to step out in the authority of the identity, God, of what you have said over my life. Because that's what brings new life. Church, run towards your true identity. Run towards your true identity. That's what God is calling you to do. I want to pray over us this morning. I'm going to ask if you would take a moment and just bow your head and close your eyes. And maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you're new to church or maybe you come quite often. Maybe someone invited you and so you're watching this service online with us. You're worshiping online. But you may be here and saying, Aaron, I've never taken that first step of really accepting what God has said over my life. And you guys, I just want you to know we all are at that place at some point in our lives where we realize we have rebelled against God. We're like Simba. We've chosen to do it our own way. And it puts us in some dangerous places. And it brings destruction to those around us. But maybe you're here this morning or you're worshiping with us online and you realize that, hey, I realize my life is not going like I want it to or like I need it to. Man, I need God in my life. And the Bible says this, that We can't be good enough to fix ourselves on our own. We can't do it by ourselves. But the beauty of the story of the Bible is that we don't have to. Jesus came and he gave himself for us so that we could be restored back into a right relationship with God. And so if that's you, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And it's simply doing this. It's admitting, God, I've sinned. I've messed up. I've tried to do things my own way. But God, I believe what you did on the cross. I believe that you're forgiving me of my sins. And God, I want a relationship with you. I want to invite you into my life. I want you to be a part of my life. I want your identity over me. 
And if that's you, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. But not just those praying that prayer for the first time or reconnecting with God. I want everyone to say this out loud. Even if you're at home by yourself, it may seem a little silly. But I want you to pray this out loud because we don't want anyone praying by themselves. Let's say this together. Jesus, I come to you. I know that I've messed up. I've tried to do life my own way. And I'm sorry. I want a relationship with you. Forgive me of my sins. Be the Savior of my life. Be the Lord of my life. Give me a brand new start. I trust your identity for me. Pray this in your name. Amen. Now, church, can you just put your hands together and celebrate for anyone who may have prayed that prayer? The Bible says this, that all of heaven is rejoicing if you prayed this morning to say, hey, I'm disconnected from God, but I want to start a relationship with Him. And I want you to know this, we don't want you doing that alone, okay? We believe this, that no one should have to walk out their faith with God by themselves. And so if that's you, it doesn't matter if you're online or here in person, you're saying, hey, I made that commitment, we want to connect with you. And so there's a simple way that you can do that to say, hey, I made that decision. You can go to newcommunity.co slash newlife, okay? So newcommunity, our website, .co slash newlife, and um, just let us know, hey, I made that decision. I've been disconnected from God, but this morning I prayed to reconnect with them, and one of our team members is going to reach out to you. We want to encourage you. We want to pray with you and help you as you start that relationship with God. And this is something else I want us to do. In this series, we've said this, hey, we want to focus on those that are disconnected from church, okay? So I know some of us, we're here every week, but we have friends and family members that are not connected to church. And so we want this, this series just to have a great way to invite them. So if you're here in person, there is a card that's in the seat in front of you, and it simply says the one. If you could grab that real quick for me. If you're up here on the front row, it's right underneath the seats in front of you, and there's a pin there. And I'm going to lead us in one more prayer, but this is what we're going to do is, as I'm praying, I just want you to write down the name of a family member, a friend, a co-worker, students, it could be a classmate, but someone that you're like, I could invite. Now let me pause right here. We're not going to reach out to them as the church, okay? You're not giving us their contact information. That's not what we're asking for. But hey, you may know someone that's disconnected from God. You may know someone that's like, they're struggling in their identity and next week, we're going to be talking about more ways that God is speaking to us from His Word. And so you have a chance to invite them. There are invite cards right there in your seat. And so I'm simply going to pray that God would give us an opportunity this week to share about what He's doing, to invite someone else to come and to connect with God. And so you can write that down while I'm praying. And then as you leave, you can drop them. There's going to be a black bucket on this back table. And you can drop them in there. And all this we're going to do is pray over them. And we're going to pray this week, once again, God would give you the opportunity to invite someone, to challenge them to come for our great series at the movies, to experience God, and that God would be able to speak to them and impact them. So let me lead us this morning in prayer. God, we thank you that you have come to save us and redeem us and rescue us, Lord. And so, Lord, we're praying for the opportunity this week that we could encourage someone, that we could invite someone to NCC and that you would be able to lead them, God, that you would open up their hearts to come and to hear your word, God, to be impacted, to experience a church family that loves them and believes in them, God. And so, Lord, as we write down the name of a co-worker, a friend, a family member, give us a moment this week, God, to invite them, Lord, a classmate, someone that could come and experience your love. Lord, we pray this in your name. Amen.